Hi everyone, I'm finally back, and today we're going to be doing a video discussing 80s boogie music, also known as electrofunk. It's one of my favorite styles ever to come out of the 80s, so I figured it's really natural not only to write an EP with that style, but to come back with a really fun video like this. So I'm going to play a little bit of the song that I'm working on, and then we'll start discussing it. We're going to discuss more of the composition and how the song's written rather than obsessing over things like synth presets and mixing because there's so many videos out there that do that. I kind of want to do something different and actually talk about the songwriting part, though we will discuss a little bit about those topics in regards to like mixing and synth presets and so on. First off, let's start with the drums. So as you can hear with the drums, they're very simple and straightforward. We're not doing really anything crazy with the patterns, but it's about the little teeny, like minute touches that we're giving it that really give it a unique feel. And as you can see here by the pattern itself, it's really, really basic. It's mostly a kick snare pattern with an occasional kick thrown in between. Um, and you can see here it's thrown in on one of the 16th notes of the pattern and it's slightly offset. And that's because I added swing to the entire song. You can choose to do this or not. It's totally stylistic. I like to do it because I like a more laid back, relaxed feel. If you want a more quantized feel, you can just lock it to the grid. And when it comes to the drums, that was more common than not back in the 80s because, you know, it was the 80s. Technology not only wasn't as good, depending on the era it was produced, MIDI was just brand new. So it was pretty common just to hear, you know, a quantized drum pattern locked right down onto the grid and everything surrounding it really helped develop the groove because it was more of a human playing it. So that's just something to keep in mind. So you can see here we have the kick, which is hitting very simply, and also the snare, which is pretty much on the, you know, two and four. We're not really deviating from that all that much, except for on the end of the phrase here. Okay, so with the hi-hats, I wanted to go for something that sounded more human and how a real drummer might play. A lot of people, especially like newer producers, they kind of just like take their hi-hats and if they have the little paintbrush tool, especially here in FL Studio, they just click and just like <laughs> across the entire song. And it's just this hi-hat with no articulation, just sitting like piercing your ears through the entire song, which is what, especially what we don't want. And because we're writing more funk oriented music, it's really important that we think about the articulation of the notes. And I'm trying to emulate exactly how a drummer might play this pattern. And you'll notice there's a context between like long notes and short notes. And this is a very basic groove that you'll hear pretty much everywhere. Essentially the first hi-hat hit is on, you know, the one, two, three, four. It's always pretty much going to be the accented one. And every one that's laying on the eighth note is the one that is not accented. So you can see it's got a shorter decay. And on top of that, the volume set a little bit lower. So it's kind of like they're hitting the stick on the hi-hat a little bit heavier and lighter. And with the additional decay on the hi-hat, uh, you know, a drummer will ha usually pretty much have their foot always planted on the pedal underneath it. And they'll kind of move it up and down depending on how, you know, they want to articulate the hi-hat. You don't have to do this exact pattern, but it's just important to keep that in mind. And an additional little thing that we do with the hi-hat is we have a little bit of a groove thrown in there here and there. So you can just hear it's with this pattern here, it's just kind of hitting right in between and we're accenting that 16th note. So as if you see my 80s like synth funk tutorial when it comes to the bass line, you'll notice that this is a concept I talked about in there. And you can see we also have swing on the hi-hat and really that groove is laying within the 16th notes. You can have an eighth note sort of like groove feel as well, but. So yeah, essentially it's got a little bit of a shuffle thrown in here and there. And then we also have like an open hi-hat. 
at the very end, which you'll hear drummers do all the time, where they just kind of open up the pedal, hit that hi-hat, and clamp it back down again. And this is just another way to accent the hi-hat and also to fill in more space. And we also have some bongos playing down on here, but I don't really want to get too much into them because it's more of just like something layered underneath all the drums. I just want to get the core concept of how the kick is, the snare, and the hi-hat all interact together. But if you'll notice one thing about the bongo is it's, it's much more spread out and it's essentially filling in the gaps everywhere else within the drums. Notice it's not really getting in the way of anything. So I just want to talk about this little fill too. If you notice, there's really no toms anywhere within the song, and it's mostly just like very simple laid back drums. So to keep it interesting, we have to think about another way we can do stuff. And as you can hear with this. Yo. One great way to add a little bit of surprise and anticipation is just like drop that kick out in the very beginning of the next bar. If you like the two of you that are watching that have listened to my music, I do that all the time in almost everything I write. So it's a really common device that I love to do. And instead of doing that, we sort of bring in a couple of different elements. One, which is this fun little like scratch sound effect. Super fun and playful, and it gives a little bit of flair and style. Um, and we have that little yo sample. Yo. Which again, got from trap sample packs. Cause like I said, I like trap music. I know that's like blast for me to say, especially in the 80s music scene, cause everyone hates it, but I love trap. Haters gonna hate. So we combine that together with having, you know, a little bit of that flair. Yo. Okay, so let's talk about the mixing of the drums and we're gonna blow through this part cause I have an entire video on how I do that. Um, which is how I gain pretty much every one of my subscribers, so I don't want to belabor you guys who've seen that video, almost certainly. So you'll see here, much like I've discussed previously, we're using a lot of sample layering. Well, not a lot, but we're using a little bit of sample layering to try to pull the best of both worlds. So you can see here I have a nice low kick sample. We're feeding it ever so slightly into a little bit of gated reverb, and we're also high-passing it because we only really want that low thumpy feel. The way I like to write my music, I come from a background of like electronic dance music. And the first genre I learned to produce back in 2005 was hip hop. So I really like to mix music with a nice low, heavy, punchy bass. And I want a song that when you hear it on subwoofers, it's gonna like rattle the car, you know, as much as I can considering it's 80s music and the style, but you know, I kind of want those kicks to really hit you. And the best way to do that for my style is layering in a lower kick that is only for that specific thing. And if you want a little secret on where to find good ones, like I said, hip hop or trap samples, like the ones that they tend to layer in with 909 kick drums, that's what I layer in here. But we want to keep it nice and 80s, right? So we just have that Lindrum layered on top of it with the low pass or with high pass cutting out a lot of the lows. And again, we're feeding that into a gated reverb that's cut off on that's a little bit high pass so there's not too many low frequencies rolling through because we need to add plenty of room and space in the low end of the mix and you'll also see that i have a side chain not only with the drip bass drum but we also have it with the snare as well both of these two are side chained pretty much to everything in the mix to varying degrees and the reason i love to do that which is pretty much why everyone else does is that's in a very very easy and effective way just to clear space. That way you don't have to worry about all these annoying mixing techniques. You just layer in some of that side chain, bam, plenty of space. And it's very crucial in the low frequencies so that the bass, you know, frequencies of the kick drum and the sine bass that's layered underneath the bass that I have in this song aren't mashing together. That's like the number one thing, how you keep a nice clear low end. You pretty much want to high pass everything you can because believe it or not, you can high pass stuff more than you might realize and it still sounds fine in the context of the mix. And we have our basic Lindrum snare, which is, you know, nice and snappy. This actually has a little bit of compression on it, but not too much. So we have also a nice little clap sample. And then additionally underneath that, we have one other clap, which is much, much more snappy has a lot more of a like, nice, strong transient to add plenty of punch on the top end of that snare drum. And if we just layer only two of these together, you can really hear that. So 
next let's move on to the other most important part besides the drums and that is the bass. So I'm just going to play the drums and bass together and then we're going to really delve in and explain it more in detail. So as you can hear by how everything's kind of fitting together, neither one is really overpowering each other, and they're still trying to provide plenty of space in between everything else so that all the other melodic elements can sit on top, but also the drums and the bass give just enough groove to really make you want to lay back or like tap your foot or move your head to it. And with this bass line, we just have a, like a nice simple balance between elongated notes and short notes. If there's really one big takeaway from all of this, this is what you need to keep in mind when it comes to writing funk music, and it's a really good rule of thumb for music in general. It's not about the notes you play, but the space in between those notes. Especially in funk, it's all about those gaps in between the notes. That's where the funk really is. And speaking of that, let's actually delve into it a little bit more in detail. We're pretty much starting off all the phrases on a really strong note. And basically, the best way to think about it, like the very first note you start off on the bass line within like each, you know, four beats is going to be the one that really grounds the, the tonic of whatever chord is playing underneath it. We're going to get a little bit into theory, but this is kind of important. So if you want to emphasize like a certain feel, depending on the chord playing, it's going to change the context. So if you have like, um, say it's like an E major, and you just want to emphasize like this standard voicing, you could just bam right there in the beginning. And that's going to prime the ear to thinking, okay, this is like the root note of the chord. And then you can kind of experiment playing out other notes in between. You could also do another way where you're starting on like a different interval of the chord, and then eventually later on landing onto the root note of the chord. Completely up to you. But if you really want a nice strong feel that's just going to guide the, listen the listener, you know, if you have that tonic note on the one, tried and true method. And especially with funk, there's a certain way you can write it where like on the very one of the beat is where it's going to be emphasized. But that's kind of like a whole nother discussion. And as you can also see here with the overarching theme of the song, I have everything set to having a little bit of swing. And you may notice that I don't use like a, a lot of workstations have like this little slider to adjust how much swing something has. I do not like using that. I recommend you avoid that at all costs and really manually get in there and actually write how offset the notes are between everything. Because number one, it's going to make it feel more human. And number two, you're really going to start over time getting a feel for how all these elements fit together. It's like a very sort of advanced subject, but you can, can think about, about it as like a swing ratio between different instruments. Depending on what instrument's playing, some might be offset more or even playing behind the beat entirely a little bit to give a different feel for the song. And in jazz music especially, that's really common. The drums are going to play kind of on their own swing. The bass is going to not be quite as swung as something like the lead element. So those are things to sort of keep in mind, but that's a really more advanced topic that I really don't want to get into here. And like I said, remember the space in between the notes. Look how much space there is between each of these notes. We're not really filling it out with all kinds of stuff. Really, there's that's that's a hell of a lot of space. And you can hear it, like your brain's not expecting the note to hit quite that late. And because we're doing having a little bit of swing with on that note and it's on a 16th note subdivision, it really just feels more fun and playful. And we sort of do the same thing there here in the next part of the phrasing. And Again, feels really fun. And you can see there's a nice juxtaposition between elongated notes and very short staccato notes. And that's another important concept to think about. How long you sustain a note is going to completely, entirely change the feel of the groove of the song. That's another thing, really, really important. Keep this in mind. If you have a very long sustain note, it's not going to have the same groove as something very short and staccato or even staccatissimo. If you want to like, impress your classical friend with now your more traditional music terminology. So staccato is just meaning something very short and punchy, and staccatissimo just means like even shorter of a note. 
And that's kind of the overarching feeling of um, a lot of funk. If you want something very, very funky, those notes tend to be a lot shorter and sometimes almost so, so short that it feels more like a percussion instrument than it does a bass instrument. And that's sort of like a very key thing as well besides the space in between, but also the length of the notes too. And you can see here, they're very short, very staccatissimo. Additionally, if you want a good scale, or two scales that are great to write funk music in, that is the pentatonic scale and the blues scale, which is, they're both essentially the same, except blues scale has a nice chromatic note thrown in there. But just keep in mind, if you're writing, you know, that sort of boogie funk music style, you can have like a very sparse bass line like this, where it's plenty of space writing in between, but there's a lot of styles where you can hear like a very busy bass line, but you know, that's really going to work in the song, you're gonna have to make sacrifices elsewhere. Well, you'll notice like a lot of those songs kind of fall either in between something kind of sparse like I wrote or something very busy. Okay, so it looks like we're really starting to get somewhere now and our next destination is on to the chords. All right, so let's do one quick listen of sort of the chords in combination with the song with all the other elements put together and we'll sort of see how it interacts together. As you can see where everything's sitting, it's actually like very like plain and simple rhythms with the exception of how we sort of um, take you a little bit by surprise by offsetting this chord here. But other than that, it's very, very simple. And I intentionally did it this way because this song I wanted to be just like all about having laying down a groove with some simple melody on top and some nice pleasant chords underneath. So when it comes to writing chords in boogie music, you can either use more simple triadic harmony, which definitely, you know, boogie songs would use but overwhelmingly, a lot of them tend to use more R&B sort of chord progressions and furthermore, like using chord extensions. So like sevenths, ninths, elevenths, thirteenths. And depending on like the songwriting, you'll find some where they do like even more advanced stuff like, you know, alter dominance, tritone substitutions, all those other more jazzy sort of concepts. Okay, so when it comes to really breaking down some of these chords, because it's using jazz harmony, things can get, you know, kind of complicated, especially Number one, if you're not really into like music theory, or if you are and you're still pretty new, like the concept of understanding seventh chords and like extensions can be a bit difficult. So I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. And one of the first things I'll notice about in terms of like the verticality, verticality of the chord, all the voicings are very simple and standard, straightforward. Like I'm not doing any crazy sort of like chord or voicings or like too many crazy inversions. And that's really a thing that I've noticed about a lot of boogie music, at least from what I've heard, is that like they don't go too crazy with the voicings. Off. And in this, we're just starting it off on an E minor ninth. So even though we're using a, a major seventh voicing here, because the notes underneath it, the bass is actually playing an E. So even though the chord itself doesn't have that E being played underneath it, because the root note of the bass is saying E, it's emphasizing that this chord is actually an E minor ninth. And it's the same thing here for this next chord because we're playing A underneath it, if you kind of remember from earlier. Again, we have a minor ninth as well. But with this one, we have the top two notes placed down here. So you can hear how there's a huge difference in sort of how it sounds. This voicing is one of my favorites for seventh chords. I use it pretty much all the time built around these, so we have our E major ninth, or E minor ninth, A minor ninth, E minor, minor ninth, A minor ninth, and then here we're going into a different chord, so we have an inversion as well, and this is actually an F major nine, but we're taking this G, which is, used, is the ninth of the chord, and rather than putting it at top, even though technically it would have some pretty nice voice leading, I wanted to keep it down here because I like the feel of having um, the note down here. So here's how it would sound in root position. 
and this is down here. So if you listen to this voicing, you might notice it sounds very 80s, doesn't it? Um, that's because in the 80s they used a lot of suspended chords, and we're not going to really get into what those are right now, but sort of a suspended chord or what I consider like a suspended voicing, I find to be pretty common, and it's like a really nice shortcut to get those 80s chord sounds and voicings, especially when we're doing like seventh chords and all sorts of extensions. And in this we're doing that too, so... So I don't want to get too crazy into the theory, especially since this is meant to be more of a crash course. But we also have this dominant chord resolving down into our main chord of the song, which is our E minor ninth. Uh, traditionally, when you have like a, a dominant chord, it generally tends to resolve into another major chord. In this case, it doesn't resolve quite as strongly as if we had it go from like, you know, a standard five resolving into the one. So it's just kind of like it's a very smooth landing into the next chord. So it still fits together and sounds proper, but it's just not as strong of a resolution as you might normally hear if you had a perfect cadence. And then the last little thing I want to talk about in the chord progressions is this little ditty here. Play it one more time. So remember how I talked about earlier creating space within the song? Because we had some space here, I thought it would be fun to throw in some little like intervals, just like... And I'm not, I mean, there's really no point in getting into like the theory of this. And 80s boogie music wasn't meant to be like crazy musically complex, it was more about the funk and the melody. And you'll find that when you're listening to it, they tend to like interject a bunch of different instruments within. You know, like the keyboard section might fulfill also a little bit as a rhythmic section too, as you can see here. And we just sort of embellish the song a little bit by adding this melody here. And when you're in the beginning, this sort of stuff, of course, you're not really going to think about it if you're a new producer. But as time goes on, it's those little elements that would add to human touch, right? Like someone who might be a more experienced like musician. What's going on there, little doggy? This is the culprit, by the way, from uh, my first video for my drums, my little doggy, with his little allergies. Say hi, little man. So another thing to keep in mind about boogie music, especially when we're thinking about the chords, is that it comes from a background of a lot of different styles. So you'll hear there's a lot of influences from gospel and a lot of boogie music, R&B, soul, funk, of course, and um, I guess you could say other adjacent genres, but those are the most common. So when you're writing it, that's something to keep in mind as well. So, And you'll notice like a lot of it tends to be optimistic and uplifting, even if the lyrics underneath it are sad. Okay, so now let's take a quick listen to the final part of this entire song that glues it all together, and that's the lead melody. As you heard earlier, the drums, the bass, and the chords are all very simple, and we're trying to make plenty of space so that the main element that's going to be the focus, which is the lead, has a nice, clean, you know, fun place to sit. Um, or if you had a vocal, same concept. So we'll just sort of play it, and I'm going to break it down. Just to, to do a brief explanation of like this part, because it's very melodic, we're kind of keeping ex no set or extended, and we're keeping the rhythm pretty simple because we're focusing on the melody and sort of how it interacts with the chords. Um, we won't get too much into detail on what sort of chord tones it's highlighting and so on, but just the concept of, if you notice here, we're keeping like a, a very fun, playful phrasing. We're starting it off with like grace notes into another note, so like, kind of boring. And sorry if there's a little bit of lag, there's one of these plugins is lagging the hell out of the project, so sorry if it's kind of sloppy. But we can take this and kind of spice it up. And that's like a big part of like funk music, especially with like um, certain styles of boogie. A lot of embellishment on the melodies using vibrato, grace notes, And then also pitch bend modulation as well. So 
so that's another thing to keep in mind with um, your lead melodies. Um, just thinking about sort of like how you can embellish it with like um, something like pitch band or vibrato and using grace notes, which is kind of essentially what we're doing here. Essentially what ended up happening is we landed on this very simple melody. I mean, essentially what I really recommend you to do is just like put a part on loop and just try like playing some simple melodies. It doesn't have to be crazy. So this project kind of has high latency. And also for some reason, one of the plugins is messing with my inputs. So sometimes it's not calculating when I play a key, but just like in this example, you could just sit around and just be like, But yeah, like just sitting around like that and improvising and just sort of trying to come up with something interesting. And why, what I ended up doing is just coming up with like something really, really yeah. simple. But I can't, unfortunately I can't really play it because this project has like a lot of VSTs lagging up behind. And as you can hear, it's not really detecting some of my inputs, but you know, you get the general idea. So as you can hear, it's very simple and rhythmic. So, you know, a great way how it contrasts this first part is that instead of it being, um, you know, very melodic and extended out, this part is very staccato and short, and we're just focusing on laying down a nice, fun groove. I think that's pretty much everything for this video. I could go on forever and really get into the, to the detail of stuff, but that would just be like several hours long, and I want to try to keep my videos short but concise. Um, some of these concepts I discussed, depending on your skill level, might be kind of advanced, and if you didn't understand them, that's totally okay. Just start like working at it part by part until you really start to understand it. If you've never written music like this before, and you're really wanting to branch out into new styles, it's going to take a while for you really to get the vocabulary of it down, and sort of how everything works. You know, the best thing I recommend, sitting down, listening to a bunch of songs, and trying to transcribe or copy parts that you like and then maybe seeing how they function and fit together. That's going to be one of the best ways you can learn. Like this video is meant to kind of be like a starting point for you to get sort of an understanding how things work together. And then in conjunction with, you know, watching this video, sort of practicing in your own time and trying to put some of these concepts that I explained to practice. And like I said, the best way to do that is listen to other music and sort of maybe copy some ideas you found in other people's music. Totally fine. No shame in it. Pretty much all of jazz music like you see some of these records back here everyone does it the shirt literally the lick one of the most common phrases within jazz music which is kind of why i wore this shirt because it was one of the things i wanted to talk about today so i think that's pretty much everything that i wanted to discuss thank you all so much for taking the time to watch this video and if you have any questions post them in the comments below if you really like this video feel free to share it with someone that you think it might help because i generally want to make tutorials that are helpful to people i don't like clickbait and I would rather get less views if it means I can make something more informative. Um, yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. And by next video, I don't mean a year from now, I promise.